coming up next on Eco Company. It's plug-in mania. We're talking electric vehicles and lots of them. The paint job that tends to get attention, it's uh, obviously a uh, lightning bolt inspired and I figured that was fitting for an electric car. We take a look at EVs from the past and the present and owners passionate about their electric rides. Then, a new superhero. It's the green cape crusader, Mr. Eco. How many paper bags do you think are used in the United States each year? We catch up with the guy who's bringing his green message to kids with music. And scientists to the rescue. But it's not what you may think. They're saving threatened sea otters. We bring in southern sea otters that are injured, stranded, or orphaned uh, with the purpose of rehabilitating them and putting them back into the wild. We go behind the scenes of the Monterey Bay Aquarium Sea Otter Rescue Program. Those stories and more coming up on Eco Company, starting right now. Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to Eco Company. I'm Josh. And I'm Jordan. And you know, people have always had a special relationship with their cars, well, since they were invented. We're among some classic hot rods from another era. Now that was a great time for cars. Yeah, and we recently met up with some car enthusiasts from a new era, the era of the electric vehicle. And their owners are just as passionate. That story's coming up later in the show. First, we have a story about a new kind of superhero. It's the green caped crusader, Mr. Eco. And as Jelena shows us, he's saving the planet one rap verse at a time. I'm here in Fresno, California, an area known as the raisin capital of the US, if not the world, thanks to its hot and dry climate. But that's not its only claim to fame. It's also known for its very own superhero. And we're about to meet him. Some know him simply as a guy who likes to get around on two wheels. Others know him as the green caped crusader, Mr. Eco. Allow me to introduce myself. Eco! I'm Mr. E-C-O, C-E-O, E to the C-O. Uh, Mr. Eco is an environmental rap superhero, so I uh, incorporate sustainable living tips into songs. This right here is my bat. Mr. Eco, a.k.a. Brett Edwards, is saving the planet one rap verse at a time. Reusable bag. Reusable bag. So it's right before you go on. What are you thinking about? What's going through your mind? Well, I'm a little, I'm anxious. I don't like to say I'm nervous. I get anxious before. Uh, my mission as Mr. Eco is to turn everybody into eco heroes. Because if they're living sustainably and doing the things that I talk about in my rap songs, then they're all superheroes working to save the planet. Reusable bag. And you're not just dressing up in tights and a cape, you're actually rapping. Yes, yes, I rap. And I don't wear tights because I am a rapper, so I feel like that would be, uh, that, that would hurt my swag level. So where did all this start? Why, in a high school environmental class. That is where I really became passionate about the issues. Before then, um, I cared, but I didn't really know the extent of, of some of the issues, and that's where I really got the the knowledge to become Mr. Eco. He doesn't just perform live. Is Cal Pali's favorite superhero. <clears throat> you can also find him in the recording studio. Whenever you go. And with the help of engineer Ahmed Nori, he records, mixes, and uploads songs to the internet. He wrote this song about food waste for his college campus. I didn't mean to waste, the food was really bad. Oh, you didn't see the sample cups they had? I'm just one person with no impact. 1,500 kids a day, you do the math. I paid for it, so it's okay. Yeah, everybody likes throwing money away. I came up with the solution of uh, starting the Clean Plate Club to be a campaign to promote just taking to eat from the buffet what you'll finish instead of having excessive food waste. Another issue he's passionate about is cleaning up his hometown. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency says the region is home to the worst air quality in the country. It has influenced my passion a little bit more coming from an area that has such bad air quality and asthma problems um, and was inspiration for the Prince of Fresh Air because I actually shot that video in Fresno at my elementary school. In Fresno, California, I was born and raised. It's hot and a lot of the time we have better days. Wheezing while breathing, asthma ain't cool. We have more and more inhalers at a school than a couple of 
the park rangers that were up to some good Told us about this great place called the woods The light went off and I decided right there That I was gonna become the prince of fresh air He says getting the message out to kids is what it's all about. Elementary school kids are the people who need to hear the messages the most because they're going to be the future. And they actually think Mr. Eco is cool and adopt to the messages. So to college kids, I'm just like a, a funky dude in a cape. But to, to elementary school kids, I'm an environmental rap superhero. One thing's for sure, whether it's reaching out to kids here. Are you guys all eco heroes now? Yeah. Good. Or from his studio. This superhero is no couch potato. Mr. Eco seems like a very busy guy with between the schools and the campus events. So what's he not doing? Do you ever have time to study? Uh, I do. There's there's a, not a lot going on outside of school and Mr. Eco for me, but it's fun. Um, I really enjoy the journey of Mr. Eco, and I've been really happy with it these past couple months. So it's been fun. Smack down, they still don't get it. Go ahead and bless this track out. Turn them out, turn them out. We do have one idea for him, though. So, do you need a sidekick? Yes. How about Princess Eco? That's perfect. This is Jelena here with Mr. Eco, and I am now Princess Eco. And with that, it's off to the next mission. Mr. Eco's the best. Up next, Darth Vader feeds the sea otters? Well, make that Jelena? This mask so they can't see you, but you can see them. We go behind the scenes of a sea otter rescue program. All right, ready? And later, electric vehicle mania. Green car fans gather to show off their cars, motorcycles, and even bikes. Riding a bike has never been so easy. <laughs> More Eco Company is still ahead. adorable southern sea otter is actually a threatened species? It's true, but a group of scientists is on a mission to save this iconic marine mammal. They're part of a group that rescues, rehabilitates, and studies sea otters, which are so important to the ocean's ecosystem. And as Jelena shows us, even sea otter pups are getting a second chance. From seahorses to kelp forests and jellyfish that glow in the dark, there is a lot to discover at the Monterey Bay Aquarium off the coast of California. But we're here for these guys, or should we say, these girls. So we currently have three exhibit females. These playful, furry crowd pleasers are southern sea otters. They're feisty in nature. I feel like I relate to them a little bit on that level. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have a lot of fun with them, um, just generally. You know, obviously them being really cute does not hurt the situation either. <laughs> Good, May, window. And here at the Monterey Bay Aquarium, their yep. days are anything Good. but dull. Our job is to pamper and take care of them. For researchers Good. like Hannah Von Weiss, that means yep. keeping them entertained, active, Good. and happy. Essentially, we take care of them through every, you know, from the start to the finish of the day. All right, so what are we doing here? We're actually uh, throwing some ice to our girls, which is a form of enrichment that we'll do with them. Um, and so if you see, they're actually every once in a while looking up at you because they know that you're going to throw them some ice. These sea otters don't just love to chomp on it. They really actually like to get out on deck and roll in the ice as well. The water in the tank is bay temperature, averaging around 53 degrees. So it's a good thing they have thick fur. But as the aquarium's Angela Haynes tells us, it's one reason the southern sea otter was once considered endangered. At one point in time, for several decades, sea otters were thought to be extinct. And the reason that they were hunted was for their beautiful fur, that pelt that is a million hairs per square inch. And a lot of people wanted that fur for coats. These days, the population is still struggling and scientists are trying to figure out why. So they are still a threatened species. Their numbers are below 2,000, so they're, they're an important species for us to protect because we were so close to losing them. So why are they so important? They're a keystone species that help keep ecosystems in balance. And sea otters are at the top of this kelp forest. They live at the top of it, but they eat from the bottom of it. They eat the filter feeders that are the urchins, the mussels, crabs, clams. All these things filter the water. So if sea otters get sick, 
then we know that something's happening throughout the entire ecosystem. This is where the aquarium's Southern Sea Otter Research and Conservation Program comes in. Known as SORAC, its goal is to help study sea otters and save the population. Animal research specialist Sandrine Hazan gives us the scoop. We bring in southern sea otters that are injured, stranded, or orphaned uh, with the purpose of rehabilitating them and putting them back into the wild. The females here, in the front tank, play a big role in the program. The public gets a glimpse of two of them having fun in the exhibit today. Abby is kind of in training right now, um, which Abby is our darker uh, female here who's actually just five years old. Uh, May, though, yes, she is one of our surrogate moms, um, and she has had, I think, three pups now that she's been a surrogate mom for. As for the third female resident, Rosa, she's a little busy at the moment. She's playing mom to a pup right now, away from the public eye. This is the aquarium's back tank, where mom and her adopted pup spend six months. The otters that come in less than eight weeks old, we hand raise them wearing our disguises, and once they get to the point that they are on solid food, we end up putting them with a surrogate, and they take on the responsibility of showing them how to forage for food and giving them the tools to survive in the wild. The goal is to teach these pups survival skills and get them prepared for life in the wild. That's where this seafood smorgasbord comes in. We've got clams, and then down at the bottom we have crabs. So we try to offer live food every day so that at different stages in their development, they have the opportunity to learn how to handle live food. Ooh, that is cold. It is cold. We're adding two kilos, so we want to go to 3.3. But you need a special uniform to play food server. This mask, so they can't see you, but you can see them. Researchers wear disguises so the otters don't get used to humans. All right, ready? And it's quick and easy, okay? They're even careful choosing their toys. We only give them naturalistic stuff, so we'll give them rocks. And if we do give them toys of any sort, it's a color that's a neutral color, you know, that is potentially something they would see out there. After six months, the pups should be ready to strike out on their own. They're tracked and monitored in the wild. It is definitely extremely gratifying to see the whole developmental process, being able to bottle feed a sea otter pup and then watch it successfully be released into the wild. They truly do make me happy. It's really fun to work with these animals. You know, you get to learn a lot about them and you just build a really fun relationship with them. It's just one reason these researchers savor every day on the job. Their hope? That through their efforts, this iconic species that represents the diversity of life in our oceans will be around for generations to come. Straight ahead, electric vehicles in all shapes and sizes, and some that only a picture can do justice. More Eco Company is straight ahead. When you say plug-in, you probably think about plugging in your hair dryer, charger, or computer. But when we say plug-in, we're talking about EVs. We're talking electric vehicles, and they've come a long way since the early days. One thing we're sure of, their owners love talking about them. Jordan takes us to a car show to see some firsthand. Hey guys, we're here at the Electric Vehicle Rally and Car Show. People here are really passionate about their electric vehicles, so let's start talking to them. They come in all shapes, makes, and sizes. But the cars here have one thing in common, and it's not gasoline. It's like driving a race car. <laughs> they all run on electricity. Once a year, fans get together across the U.S. to celebrate these electric riding machines at National Plug-In Day. This is a gathering of the general public to meet enthusiasts like myself, people who actually own these cars. We're in AP Environmental Science at school, and so our teacher sends out like a bunch of events that we could go to because they're required for the class, and so we thought this would be a fun one to come to. Today, there's even some electric two-wheelers. We are very excited to try all electric bikes, so we drove here and uh, we bring all our helmets. <laughs> some vehicles are new, but many are older models converted by their owners. It's very do-yourself, hands-on, 
Tom Seidel is with the Electric Auto Association. We've been doing this rally for 40 years since 1972. So back in 1972, the way you got an electric car is you made it yourself. So just what is an electric car? It's one that doesn't run on a combustible gas engine. Instead, it gets its juice from electric batteries and you charge them by plugging in at home or at a charging station. Electric cars are, for the most part, they're a more efficient drivetrain for one. An electric motor is more efficient than an internal combustion engine. You can save burning gasoline and pollute the uh, air and just go electric and uh, you can recharge all the time for the lifetime of the bike. The paint job, it tends to get attention it's um, obviously uh, lightning bolt inspired, and I figured that was fitting for an electric car. This EV is a converted sports car built for performance. By looking at this, it looks like a lot of stuff, and it looks a little bit complicated. Can you tell us about it? That's the beauty of an electric car. It really is not nearly as complicated as, as it seems. All you have is you got a battery source, a power source, a controller which regulates that power source, and an electric motor which is in the middle. Uh, you don't have a, an ignition system, you don't have a cooling system. It took about 14 months to turn this baby into a green machine. The thing I enjoy most about working on this car is I can work on it for hours and I don't have grease all over my hands. And it's a very clean process. Though not mainstream yet, EVs have already racked up about 200 million miles on U.S. roads. Part of the mission of Electric Auto Association is to try to educate the general public on what kind of mileage can you really get, what does it really mean to charge the car. Some are designed for longer commutes. Some vehicles are designed just to get you down the street. Well, this is a unique car or motorcycle, you said, to be motorcycle. exact. It's technically a motorcycle. It's, it's, it really is kind of a car, but it's technically legally in the eyes of California. It's a Three motorcycle. Three wheels motorcycle. Right. So let's talk about the recycled aspect, because okay. looking at some car logos, so tell us about okay. how recycling played a role in making this car. Okay, well, uh, obviously the signs are recycled, leftover road signs. Almost all the metal in it is used or recycled. The bed of the truck is actually, uh, used to be my dining room table. <laughs> so you're really reusing so here. So I cut it up and, <laughs> and used it. This specially constructed vehicle needs a few more things, like headlights and taillights, to be road ready. But these two-wheeled wonders already are. Electric light vehicle. Yes. So what exactly does that mean? So electric meaning it runs on a motor, which is electric. Light means you can carry it with Literally you wherever light. you want to go. Literally, light. These electric bikes are all of the above, and Kumar Ganapathy with ELV Motors is showing us a few. So we have two different electric bikes right here, different sizes, different weights. So let's start with this one. Can you tell us about it? So the Velo Mini is built more for the commuter. This is a folding electric bike. Uh, it weighs about 30 pounds. This is a larger bicycle. This is more for short distance commuting. This has a range of about 20 miles per battery. If you know how to ride a bicycle, this is, this is the, the mode of transportation for you. So because these aren't just your average bike, is there any trick to riding them? Not at all. If you know how to ride a bicycle, it's easy to get on it. You turn a little throttle, and the more you throttle, the faster it goes. So should we try it? Go right ahead. All right. OK, let's take her for a spin. I'll tell you one thing, riding a bike has never been so easy and fun at the same time. And I'm not the only fan. I've learned that I really want an electric bike. Uh-oh, parents, are you listening? <laughs> we can't forget about the bigger two-wheeled version, too. So this is not something you see every day, and that is for sure. So tell us about this electric motorcycle. So this is a, an electric motorcycle conversion I did about two years ago. I uh, didn't know what I was doing at all. So started from not knowing anything about electricity, uh, about motorcycles really even. The motor is over here. The motor is actually in the hub. It has lithium ion batteries in it. It has about 36 of them. This is the motor controller and safety system. It doesn't have a charger. So an interesting thing about motorcycles as opposed to say cars is that there's not a whole lot of room. So the charger is not on, on the bike. It's in my backpack. So for this crowd, it's been an inspiring day to both share and learn more about electric cars. From an eco standpoint, 
no gasoline, no emissions, clean riding vehicles. How far they've come? See only folks like this that kind of uh, um, kind of lead the way, lead the way for the rest of us. And how far they'll go? I think I'd definitely start a trend around campus driving this around. One thing's for sure. It looks like electric vehicles are finally here to stay. That wraps up another episode of Eco Company. Thanks for tuning in. For more information on the stories in our show or to send us your feedback, check out our website at eco-company.tv. And make sure to friend us on Facebook. Remember, you too can be a part of the solution. We'll see you next time on Eco Company. In Fresno, California, I was born and raised. It's hot and a lot of the time we have bad air days. Wheezing while breathing, asthma ain't cool. We had more and more inhalers at our school than a couple of park rangers that were up to some good. Told us about this great place called the woods. The light went off and I decided right there that I was going to become the prince of fresh air. Yeah.